Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. My name is Suranjali Seal and like I always say, if you are somebody that loves literature and is all about literature, then this is the channel for you. In our video today, we're going to continue with our discussion of the general prologue to the Canterbury Tales, which we had already begun. I have discussed it and I have begun discussing it in detail, that too, with analysis slides in my previous video, where we uh, have discussed the characters, I think seven to eight characters, if I'm not mistaken, we've completed up until the friar, right? And today we're going to continue from there. We're going to begin with the merchant and then we're going to cover a few more characters that appear in the general prologue to the Canterbury Tales and Chaucer's description of them. Now, if you remember the format, if you've watched my previous video, you would know that I have included the original text and the modern day English translation of the text. And we've discussed each character in detail. And I've also included analysis slides. Analysis slides uh, have notes in them. I've discussed... Um, the characters, the symbolisms, their importance in detail. So we've discussed the characters. We've done a, a detailed character analysis also of the characters that we've covered so far. So in the same format, we're going to continue with this video. It is part two of the part one video. And uh, we are going to start with the merchant. So without any further ado, let's get right into it. So let us look at uh, the merchant. So there was a merchant and he had a forked beard. Now, if you um, remember um, Pirates of the Caribbean, Jack Sparrow, he is the one who has or he keeps a um, forked beard. Now, if you have watched movies that feature Vikings, Vikings also did keep forked beards. Their beards were uh, more thick and then sometimes they used to braid the beards also. Here I've included the picture of Jack Sparrow. So his uh, beard is not as thick as sometimes the uh, Vikings would keep, but that's a forked beard. So it looks like a fork, right? So so that's a forked beard. His um, clothes were multicolored and he sat high on his horse. On his head, he wore a Flemish beaver hat that is made of the fur of a beaver. You can Google and see what is a Flemish beaver hat. The different kinds that are made, the hats that are made. But that's a beaver. That's an animal. If you know that they're very, very good at making dams, uh, natural dams, right? They're very good at making dams. So this is a beaver. So the fur of this beaver is used to make the hats. So it's a Flemish uh, beaver hat and his boots were fastened neatly and elegantly he expressed his reasons and opinions in a solemn manner always talking about the increase in his profit so he's a merchant uh, sort of uh, you can say that he's uh, business minded so he's always talking about his profits um, uh, and you know sometimes when you always talk about his profits you can get this idea that maybe he's showing off so he's always talking about the increase in his uh, profits so if you meet somebody who's always talking about I had profit here I had profit there you know I accumulated this much money there you know I accumulated this much money from this business this bargain if you keep talking like that doesn't that a hint at you being a show off it does right you don't talk about your losses you don't talk about how sometimes you can be vulnerable at the hands of fate but he talks about his profits the increase in his profits uh, and it's not that he's only talking he's always talking about his profits so technically sometimes psychologically if you think people when they keep talking about profits right they're either trying to make an impression on you or if they're or trying to show you how much power they have or you know they think that that's their word you know profits are the only things that that is going to give them respect so they always talk about profits and money okay so he wanted the sea to be guarded at any cost uh, against the danger of pirates so you would know that pirates um, uh, uh, were rampant at that time uh, they, the ships would cargo ships would get attacked and during Chaucer's time and much after that also because you know, we have sea routes and rules and regulations now, but we are talking about the time in the 1400s when Chaucer wrote the Canterbury Tales. So during that time, uh, sea routes were still being discovered. Uh, you remember the age of Elizabeth has not yet come. Okay, so the age of Elizabeth is also known as the age of exploration, where so much of navigation and exploration and mapping of the world was going on. This is Chaucer's time. So during Chaucer's time, it was not as open. The seas were still threatened by pirates. So if you have some cargo uh, like being transported from one location to the other, so there, there was a chance that that cargo would be um, looted by the pirates, attacked, the ship would be attacked, and then the cargo would be looted so he as a merchant who has to actually ship his um, business so to say he has to ship his um, 
uh, business from one place to the other, uh, another and I'm not saying shift ship that is his items were being shipped his business was flourishing right at that point in time so he was very concerned about uh, uh, the danger of pirates between Middleburg and Orwell so maybe that's the route that he used to take so he's saying that he was very concerned about the attacks that were happening along that route so he was good at bargaining and could sell at a profit uh, this worthy man always retained his wits that is he was always good humored okay he always kept uh, in a good mood uh, that no one guessed that he was in debt so you see he's in debt but he's talking always about his profits so Chaucer noticed Chaucer understood that this person is in debt and nobody could understand that he's in debt because of the way he talked because of the humor that he kept so again like I said when you're always talking about profits it's technically like you're trying to make an impression and it's always when you want to extract some kind of respect some kind of response from the person you're talking to so you're always like you know i have this profit you know i own this much you know i do this i do that it's technically you're trying to make an impression on someone right so this is exactly what the merchant is doing because he conducted his dealings and bargains with so much dignity that he was truly a worthy man but the fact is that i do not know what his name was so in um, the friar when we ended with the friar in the previous video we know his name right his name is hubert but here he says that i don't know what his name was but um, he was truly a worthy man because considering his profession uh, he conducted his profession well and the way he carried himself people could not even understand that he was in debt and he's always talking about profits he was always talking about his business so see I have given analysis slides to all the characters now the merchant over here you will not understand his character uh, more than what is said over here unless and until you read his tales the tales that he says in the Canterbury Tales so we're going to deal with that when we uh, do the Canterbury Tales the tale that he uh, talks about this is a general prologue so this is all that Chaucer has to say about him so you don't have to really brainstorm anything over here this is very very direct the same thing is with the clerk of, uh, clerk of Oxford we're going to go to the clerk of Oxford now in the next slide so there too he's very direct about what he talks about the clerk of Oxford so we're going to analyze all of that so let's get right into it now let us have a look at the clerk of Oxford uh, how Chaucer describes him in the general prologue to the Canterbury Tales so there was also a clerk of Oxford who had studied logic for a long time so this clerk of Oxford had studied logic for a long time whenever there's reference to logic you will know that Aristotle has to be mentioned there I have dealt with logic I have dealt with uh, Aristotle his system of syllogism and deductive inductive reasoning all of these things that center logic I've dealt with it extensively in my Aristotle videos I've dealt with it in my Francis Bacon videos also so you will now know that logic imbibes or embodies in it all of this so our clerk of Oxford who appears in the general prologue to the Canterbury Tales devoted his time into studying logic and he did this for a long time he has been doing this for a long time that's what Chaucer tells us then he says he was as thin as um, as thin was his horse as is a rake even he himself could not be called fat so his horse the horse that he had with him uh, was as thin as a rake now if you know what a rake is particularly if you've watched um, movies uh, from in the west coming from the west there are many movies that feature rakes particularly with reference to the autumn season so I want your you to imagine this literature is about imagination right so imagine that there's a backyard and there it's the autumn season and a lot of leaves have fallen and accumulated in your yard now you have to accumulate and remove it from the grass right you have to remove those leaves from the grass what do you do you use the tool which is known or which is called a rake a rake is a tool it has teeth it had mul multiple teeth okay so it can be three teeth it can be four any number of teeth which is used to actually accumulate um, uh, or to cut the grass or to accumulate the leaves no you actually rake your grass or you rake your backyard so that all the leaves that have fallen and accu uh, from fallen into the ground you can actually uh, accumulate them into a single pile into one whole pile before you dispose them off so a rake is like that it has multiple teeth and uh, it is used sometimes for cutting also but even if you know hay hay is also a rake is used to actually accumulate hay also to actually separate hay or to accumulate uh, accumulate it so that's a rake it has multiple teeth it's an agricultural tool so here what he's saying is uh, his horse was as thin as a rake now of course the rake has teeth right but you have a handle to it right which you use to actually uh, rake the leaf so just like you have the handle of a broom so you have a handle of a rake also and it's very long so you can stand and actually rake the leaves so that handle is very very thin and he's saying the horse that this um, 
uh, clerk of Oxford has is as thin as a rake. That means it was impoverished. He probably did not have the money. The clerk of Oxford did not have the money and the means to feed his horse well and take care of it. He must have been poor. And this whole... Um, his, this whole idea of the clerk of Oxford being poor is highlighted by many other things he says. Another thing which hints at this clerk of Oxford being poor is the fact that he himself could not be called fat. That means he was poor, he, he did not eat well, he uh, uh, compared to some of the other characters who are very uh, wealthy and healthy, this clerk was poor probably, that's why he himself could not be called fat because he had hollow cheeks and was self-restrained. So he was self-restrained and he had hollow cheeks. That means probably he did not get good food to eat or did not eat well. So therefore he had hollow cheeks. He was very thin and um, his other cloak was completely worn out. So technically probably he did not have like money to purchase a new robe also. So the one that he had was completely worn out, overused. Okay, so that is what he's saying here. And for he had not yet gotten himself the rectorship of any parish church or because he was not worthy enough to seek a job. So there might be two reasons why he is poor. First, after studying logic and all of this, he did not apply for a job. Probably that's why he was not worldly enough. He did not care if he had a job or not. He loved his books. He, you will see now when we'll move forward that he devoted everything that he had to books. So he did not, he was not worldly enough, did not care enough to go and get a job so that, you know, like he'll get earnings from it. Or for he had not yet gotten himself the rectorship of any parish church. So he did not apply for a job, did not finish his studies also so that he can go and apply for the rectorship of a church, right? So probably it's because of this that he had income issues and that's why um, uh, his, his countenance or his appearance was such. So he would rather have at his bed... Um, bed's head 20 books in black and red covers so in uh, in, in the uh, the book's head right I mean his bed's head he would rather keep a lot of books rather than any other materialistic thing so all he cared about are books okay so then rich robes garments or uh, oh, okay of Aristotle and his philosophy he loved Aristotle and his philosophy like I said if it has to do with logic you will have references to Aristotle he would want books at the head of his head of Aristotle 20 books in black and red of Aristotle and his philosophy so like I said again I'm repeating it again wherever there's logic uh, mentioned Aristotle will find his way somewhere because he is one of those thinkers and philosophers who have ex, uh, who have actually uh, contributed immensely to logic, uh, to logic and philosophy. So therefore, you have references to Aristotle here, of course. Then you have he had hardly possessed any gold with himself and all the money that he borrowed from his friends on books and learning he spent. So you can clearly see what gives him uh, joy. You can clearly see what he likes. He likes reading books and all the monies that he even managed to borrow from his friend because his income was very near and um, he did not have good income you can understand that by his appearance only so the fact that he's borrowing money from his friends he should actually look after his livelihood and make ends meet but all he does is use that money to go and buy more books so on books and learning he spent so and devoutly prayed for the souls of those who provided him with the resources for his studies so um, he prayed for those people who actually helped him with the resources for his studies of studies took he most interest and was very careful about it as well he did not speak a word more than was needed so he did not speak a word more than was needed so that means he was very calculative that means he knew exactly what to say and how to say it and uh, there are hints of the fact that he might have been reserved so he said only that much in a situation that was needed he did not talk more than he was supposed to or that was he did not talk more than that was needed so and even that was said in an appropriate and modest manner so he was very balanced and calculated in his conversations with people and he spoke briefly in a modest manner his speech was full of noble thoughts and morality now before you know that all these pilgrims are going to tell us stories right as we progress through the Canterbury this is just an introduction in the general prologue as Chaucer describes these characters to us. So this last part where he says his speech was full of noble thoughts and morality and gladly would he learn and gladly teach. What does this tell us? This kind of hints at the fact that we can expect as readers that when the clerk of Oxford will, will tell his story to us in the Canterbury Tales, there will be some touch of morality to it. He will try to kind of uh, give a moral lesson 
through his uh, uh, tail and we can expect that because in his character in, in itself we see that he is modest, he is noble, he likes morality, he has immense um, uh, liking for learning and studies and gladly would he learn and gladly teach. So there is a hint here again I am repeating that in his story we might get uh, a moral uh, lesson imparted to us. So we will see that when we actually cover his story. So now we are going to move on further. Now we are going to look at the sergeant of law as Chaucer describes him in the Canterbury Tales. So there was also a sergeant of law, lawyer of the highest degree. He was vigilant and wise. He often visited the cathedral porch where um, lawyers congregated. He was excellent in his profession. He was discreet and worthy of great reverence or respect. So and his words are full of wisdom often at court sessions held in the county. He functioned as a judge through a letter of appointment commissioning him to hear cases of all sorts because of his knowledge and his reputation. So he wore many large robes and much wealth. So great a buyer of land was nowhere known. He managed to acquire unrestricted possession of them. Of them. He purch his purchases could not be challenged in any court of law. Nowhere so busy a man as he there was. Let us just analyze it this far. Now see. Suppose uh, we have somebody who is very good. Let's take the example of the lawyer. Now, this sergeant of law, or the lawyer of this highest degree, this person is very well versed in law. He knows his trade very well. He knows the laws very well. And he was so uh, knowledgeable. He knew a lot of things and he conducted his his uh, way of life and his business, that is uh, his profession so well that he earned himself a very good reputation. Now, imagine... Okay, there are wealthy people in the society. Now, some people come to him and they'll say, please, please come and help us with this case. Uh, we will give you all the money that you need because and he's he will say, no, I, I cannot help you. I cannot uh, win this case for you because it's all a matter of luck, all a matter of luck, whether you will win or you will lose all a matter of luck, whether you will have it your own way. Right. But the person is like, see. I know that you can actually make us win because of your reputation and your knowledge because you're so good at what you do. So we'll give you some extra money, just get our job done. Then he's like, okay, then maybe I can try. Uh, like little by little, the people who gave him money will go and tell their relatives, you know, we gave him money and he got our job done. Those people will go and tell their trustworthy people that, you know, we gave him money and he got our job done. Now, more and more people will come to this person, the sergeant of law and say that, can you make this happen for us? We'll give you more money. And for sure, surely they would win the case or they will have everything according to them. You know, everything will happen according to them because this person was really, really good at what he did. What does this sound like? Doesn't it sound like corruption a little bit? Now, Chaucer does not come outwardly and directly tell us this. This is what he did, that he was corrupt. He never says that. Chaucer, I am repeating it again. Here there is no, no um, uh, reference to corruption. But you remember, even when we talked about the friar, when we talked about the prioress, uh, Chaucer, what does he employ? He employs satire, he employs irony, sarcasm to actually tell us about the characters. So you listen to this again. Okay, what, what I read just now, you just listen to it and does not it sound a little fishy? He was discreet and worthy of great reverence. Okay, he was, he was worthy of respect. Why? His words were full of wisdom, naturally because he had a lot of knowledge, he knew his profession well. Often at court sessions held in the county, he, was, he functioned as a judge through a letter of appointment commissioning him to hear cases of all sorts because of his knowledge and reputation. Clean. They are actually asking you to go and uh, listen and head or maybe through a letter of appointment, they commissioned him that you come and hear cases of all sorts because he was such a knowledgeable and reputed person. Clean. Then you listen to this part. He won many large robes and much wealth. So great a buyer of land was nowhere known. He managed to acquire unrestricted possession of them. His purchases could not be challenged in any court of law. Doesn't it sound fishy to you? He's, he's worn many large robes. He is a lawyer. If you are through straight means, you cannot get extra anything. You have to actually struggle through straight means and that's how you earn what you get. But this person has many large robes at home. Fishy. He managed to acquire many lands. Nowhere else could you find a buyer of land. Probably people were scared to challenge him. 
to question him because he was so good. He was a, a sergeant of law. He was a lawyer. He can defend himself. Okay, he knows all the statutes and the law by by heart, so he can defend himself and win the case. Nobody would want to go and challenge him. You get it. He managed to acquire unrestricted possession of them. Again, fishy. You see, nobody would want to go and challenge him because he was so good at what he did. So when he bought a land, even if there are loopholes, do you think anybody will go and uh, go and you know file a case against him or his land? Even if they did. Because he was so good in his knowledge and wisdom and his profession, probably he won all the cases. Now, he says his purchases could not be challenged in any court of law. How? How? Why not? You know, that's the question that should come to our minds. Nowhere so busy a man as he there was, yet he made it appear that he was more busy than he actually was. So, you know, there is this hint at appearance versus reality. Then he could quote all the court cases and judgments that had taken place since time in memorial, since the time of William the Conqueror. What he's trying to say here is, since a long time, all the court cases and judgments that had happened, he managed to remember all of them. And he could also so draw up the draft a legal document that no man could find any fault in his writing. So you see, again, there nobody challenged him in the court of law. Nobody questioned his acquiring of so much of land and wealth because he could draw up a draft. He could draw up and draft a legal document so flawlessly that no one could find any fault in his writing. So you see the loopholes are over here. Probably now you see again I'm saying he does not just outrightly, Chaucer does not outrightly come and say that this person is corrupt. Rather he says he has a lot of wisdom, that he has a lot of, um, uh, ex uh, he has a lot of experience and also he uh, is very worthy he says and he's worthy of respect also. But when you read about his life, there are loopholes there. There are very many question marks to his character. And also, you know, probably he's using sarcasm and irony to describe the sergeant of law to us. Now, you see, he could quote every statute. He had memorized them. He wrote wearing multicolored coat. And um, his coat was uh, belted with a silk girdle that had small stripes. A girdle, I'll tell you, it's a belt basically. So around his waist there was a girdle and uh, the coat was um, um, belted with a silk girdle that had small stripes. So his, he wore the coat and then he had a belt around it. And of his array I will, uh, array, I will not dwell no further or any further. So this is what he tells us about the sergeant of law. Now we're just going to do a detailed analysis of his character. Now see, the sergeant of law is the medieval version of a lawyer. They were the king's servants in legal matters. So a sergeant of law, this is the analysis. Okay, now we've discussed about Chaucer's description. This is the analysis. So the sergeant of law, who is the sergeant of law? During the medieval times, they were the lawyers. Uh, they were the king's personal lawyers, so to say. They were the king's servants in legal matters. That is, whatever legal matters would go, the lawyer that would be serving the king is the sergeant of law. So from among them were chosen the judges of the court. So suppose you have 20 uh, sergeants of law. Amongst these 20, five will be chosen as judges. Now when they're chosen as judges, they can uh, fight civil cases also, uh, criminal cases also they can fight. They're like judges for the people also. But sergeants of law, amongst 25 are judges, the rest of the 15 are still sergeants of law. So from among them were chosen the judges of the courts. Those who were not judges could continue to plead in court and obtain fees and ropes from suitors. So a judge who has been appointed, 20 people, again I'm saying example, 20 people, or let's take 10 for example, 10 people are sergeants of law. Of these 10 people, 5 are made judges in the court. Now they are hearing cases and doing everything, criminal cases, uh, civil uh, cases, they are handling it in the court. Now the remaining five are still sergeants of law, right? Now they, they are still allowed to plead cases and if somebody would come to them and say that can you please fight this case, they would be allowed to do that also. Now naturally he will say, Ki, okay you give me some extra, because the official judges are sitting there. Now to come and appeal to them also, people could approach, so they would probably uh, charge higher money. They would say, give me more money and I'll, uh, I'll actually do this for you. And also the plus point is that they would be uh, 
those the sergeants of law would be servants of the king directly the king if the king has any problems these are the people that he will uh, reach out to so you understand there's a reputation there there's this sense of link and directness there so those who are not judges could continue to plead in court and obtain fees and ropes from the suitors so you can understand there is still a huge chance for corruption and probably i'm using the word here probably so when you uh, write your answers also as far as the sergeant of law is concerned you have to write probably this is what chaucer meant uh, probably chaucer is using satire and irony over here to actually hint at the fact that probably this person was not what he seemed there might be hints of corruption for example he had so much robes he had this and that those are the examples that you have to give so there's chances of fraud with a touch of irony like i said chaucer describes this and sarcasm and satire so he does all the things that lawyers are supposed to do he speaks well writes a, a, an airtight contract and knows his case or law uh, by heart so successful is he that he's often appointed by the king as a judge in the court of law Le uh, led to great financial success as well for we learn that nowhere was uh, there so great a purchaser as him and all his land and all of this thing all the examples that i've mentioned and since the nobility already seem to favor him his chances of becoming one of them soon seem even more assured so this is like upward mobility the sergeant of law is using his profession to actually uh, go like uh, travel upward the social ladder so from the sergeant of law he's trying to seep into the nobility and the nobility already favored him because of his genius because of his reputation because he's good at what he does so he's trying to climb up the social ladder you see so he is the chances of him becoming one of them that is one of the nobility one of he for him to become a noble um, a part of the nobility also uh, seem more even assured you know there are chances of him to become part of the nobility because he is favored now ironically however it is his cunning and not his goodness that is highlighted this is what i'm trying to tell you that it is his cunning that is highlighted it is not his goodness that he did not fight uh, cases because of truth and justice there's no mention of truth and justice but what is mentioned is what he has acquired what is mentioned is how there can be no flaw that he cannot even be challenged in a court of law so where's truth where is justice so you see this is chaucer sergeant of law so i hope that you've understood this and now we're going to move on to the next character that appears in the general prologue to the canterbury tales so before we dive deep into the character of the franklin there's some historical facts that we need to clarify okay so let's just figure that out first so a franklin was somebody who was not a serf he is part just understand this the franklin is a member of the wealthy middle class he is somebody who is a free man he is a free holder or a free man so who is not a free man so a franklin is a free man and opposite to that we have a serf a franklin is somebody who is not a serf so you will have to understand who is a serf first so i'll explain this very easily so we have the zamindari system okay if you've read indian uh, indian history so you will know that the zamindari system existed and under that what happened you had a zamindar he had a, a, a he had land which he owned and then you had the peasants who worked on the land right they were the people who who actually uh, went through a number of atrocities which are unthinkable also they are the ones who had suffered at the hands of the zamindar but that's okay that's another story for the purpose of literature what i want to explain is that the zamindar and the peasants had a bonded relationship right the peasants were bonded or were in bondage with the zamindar the zamindar was the one who actually owned the land they gave their labor on that land and the zamindar reaped the fruits of it all right but in the same process these people were the ones who suffered the most they came from a very humble background they were poor and they were the ones giving the labor right in the same sense we have the serfs under the feudal system we have the nobility people who held lands there were noble people who belonged to the nobility they held lands and then you have the serfs the serf used to sell their uh, or give their labor they would work on that land and they were in bondage to this people in the nobility who owned the land so they did not have direct they were tenants and they did not have direct access to the land they could not do anything without the permission of the zamindar technically to say so they could not do anything um, on their own so they were in bondage to these people who owned the land now uh, franklin is is somebody who is not a serf 
that is he is a free man he is not in bondage to these people from the nobility and our franklin in the uh, canterbury tales is a member of the wealthy middle class he is the member of the wealthy middle class our Fla franklin over here and he is somebody who has accumulated and amassed a lot of wealth and he is in the company of the sergeant of law so with this thing clear in our head that the franklin over here is somebody who is a free man a freeholder he had property rights he could own and uh, he could own um, he could own the title to a land he he was entitled to own land this person this free man this free older our uh, free um, holder our franklin in the canterbury tales was part of the um, uh, uh, rich middle class or the higher middle classes and this is what chaucer has to say about him he was a uh, some uh, there was a franklin in his company whose company in the sergeant of law's company now what does this tell us about the sergeant of law that he had contacts that he has these wealthy people around him he had contacts with this person they must have been friends that's why they came to the pilgrimage together so he was in the company of the franklin and i'm um, sorry of the sergeant of law so the sergeant of law he kept these kind of contacts with wealthy people probably and uh, the franklin was one of them and with his beard as white as a daisy's so what does it mean it's not something that chaucer just wrote for poetic um, Uh, feels he did not just write that he his beard was white as a daisy is just because it sounds pretty no he wrote this to tell us of his age his beard was white as a daisy is which means that it had grayed his his beard was grayed uh, was gray in color so that means he was an elderly person it tells us about his age he was not a young person that's what is hinted at over here of his complexion was he sanguine his complexion was sanguine anything with sanguine always remember has to do with blood the sanguine over here would mean reddish red in color so his face had that reddish hue and um, he was fond of uh, taking a sauce of wine almond milk over a loaf of bread to eat so now you'll see everything is about eating over here for him so he always practiced living a life of pleasure as he was the follower of the philosophies of epicurus and then uh, who used to recommend a life of luxury and held that complete pleasure was the source of complete happiness so it's about pleasure for him and that's a source of happiness according to him so he kept a grand house as he was a householder uh, that is he was a host also as a great as saint julian himself the bread and ale in his house were always uniformly good a man with better wine cellar did not exist so what am i trying to tell you over here is that this man right from the beginning of his um, um description over here if you see he has been derived as somebody who is materialistic right pleasure his source of pleasure he says that you aim at pleasure and you'll be happy for your whole life okay and then this part epicurus he is following the philosophies of somebody who advocated for luxury so again it's about materialism so saint julian i want to tell you who is saint julian he is the patron saint of hotel keepers of travelers and boatmen okay so he is saint julian so this part where he's saying that uh, he kept a grand house as he was a householder a hotel keeper or he is somebody who is a good host okay as great as saint julian himself so this is what is alluded to here so everything about him is about materialism outwardly pleasure okay it's nothing about spirituality and his inner self so his house was never without meat pie there was such a plenty of meat and fish in his house that one would think that it rained in his house of food and drink of all the food that men could think like the changing seasons of the year he changed or varied his meals also he had a large number of fat partridges in the basket of his house so this is what they're telling us about him again materialistic food 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 materialistic food 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 that's everything that we know about saint julian i mean sorry about uh, the franklin over here and he's saying that there are number of fat partridges don't get confused we keep uh, 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 chickens right in the farms nowadays so he had partridges so that's a picture of a partridge i've given there and he kept fat partridges probably like he bred them in his house so that later you could cook them and eat them right so it's basically that and many kinds of fish in his pond at home sad was his cook if his sauce were not ready pungent and sharp and table were out of place his table was fixed in his hall he fixed permanently the table in his hall and um 
ready for use always so he was a good host so technically because he uh, through this kind of uh, he was hosting these kind of meals and people would naturally flock to him right and they would eat so his table had to be ever ready for use so at court session there was he lord and benefactor he was often representative of his county in the parliament now let's just understand what a county is a county is a specific region of state or country so it's like a district you know you have your small sets of local government that take care of each each district like that so a county is like that there is a local government that manages each individual individual county so in other words it's like a district so in his area in his district he would often represent his county his district in the parliament so that shows his uh, power as well right so he had power he had prestige he had money okay and that's how he was living his life so his association with the sergeant of law also tells us right that they had connections with each other so this is the dynamic that we're talking about now he uh, was often representative of his county in the parliament a dagger and silk bag hung at his girdle so there was a belt around his waist so that's a girdle so he has a belt around his waist and a dagger and a silk bag hung there as white as morning silk he had been the sheriff and auditor also so again political power prestige so here is saying the sheriff had a series of duties that included keeping the peace and providing men at arms to support the king in times of strife so this you have to understand a sheriff of course he's looking up to law and order peace in his own county but also to provide men at arms even in indian history you will know that um, Uh, people who owned lands they were also required to maintain an army and uh, this you can do it in history it's a different chapter altogether i'm just giving an idea so you they would own land and maintain an army so whenever there was war they would send this to aid the king similarly a sheriff over here this uh, Fr uh, franklin who is serving as a sheriff he would of course maintain law and order but also whenever there's a crisis whenever there's a war he would from his own county he would gather men and send them to fight for the king okay so another important duty was the collection of taxes on behalf of the crown that's why the word auditor so he was the sheriff and auditor as well so there was nowhere such a, a worthy servant of the king so he was the servant of the king even the sergeant of law was the servant of the king right like i said so that association is there that's why they're in each other's company as well so this is what we have learned about his character now we're just going to do a short analysis of the franklin's character Now see a Franklin was a free tenant of the crown could hold lands without the obligation of military service or rent now there was no obligation for him he could hold land and without the obligation of military service or rent so he did not have to pay rent to the crown he could hold on the land and he he could give military service or he could not in our case in our franklin's case he has served as the sheriff and auditor right so this is who a franklin is white beard suggests that he is old a franklin in the canterbury tales is a free man he however is not free from the vice of gluttony now this is what i wanted to tell you in the seven deadly sins if you know of the seven deadly sins one of them is gluttony and gluttony is eating and drinking too much that is you have no control over it okay so he is like that over indulgence so this is the character of our franklin he is over indulgent in food drink pleasures of life and um, this is uh, he is free from all of that the whole um, bondage okay he is free from the bondage system but he is not free from the vice of gluttony and over indulgence he tells a tale of virtue but most of what is said about him refers to his grand taste for sensual delights so well the land owner excellent host so this is who the franklin is now we're going to move on further so now we are going to talk about the guildsmen that appear in the uh, canterbury tales uh, chaucer's prologue to the canterbury tales and they are one of the most important representations in the canterbury tales because these are real life people who have inspired him to weave these characters so we're going to look at each one of them so there was a herbardasher a carpenter a weaver a dyer and a tapestry maker and they were all there in the tavern inn and they were also going to embark in this pilgrimage to canterbury so a herbardasher is a business or a person a businessman or a person who uh, sells small articles for sewing 
dress making and knitting such as buttons ribbons and zippers so basically he is somebody who is into uh, these uh, crafts arts and crafts we say right so sewing dress making and knitting so you imagine nowadays whenever we go to these arts and crafts shop okay at least i remember from my school days when we used to go uh, to buy these uh, things for our arts and crafts classes so we used to get these in one um, uh, shop only we used to have buttons here we used to have uh, say wool there and knit uh, knitting materials here and there and we used to get all of our supplies from this shop now imagine haberdasher is like that he has all these supplies of sewing dressmaking and knitting and buttons ribbons everything he is a businessman of all of that okay and then you have a weaver who weaves clothes a dyer who dyes clothes and a tapestry maker so what is a tapestry tapestry is a form of textile art traditionally woven by hand on a loom so it's a uh, hand loom woven and normally it is used to create images rather than patterns so hand loom you know when you wear a uh, tires also it's usually woven by hand and your patterns here tapestries they dis, uh, they actually weave pictures now the picture that i've included there that is a tapestry i think you've seen many of these sometimes tapestries especially in castles no they would have tapestry you know of sceneries even like hills and animals and beautiful beautiful scen sceneries if you have watched movies or if you have actually seen tapestries like that they would be featured in the walls of castles also so tapestry is like that it is a form of textile uh, art and so they were all uh, they all wore the same kind of clothes that was probably prescribed by distinguished organization so this hints to us that they must have been or they are a part of a distinguished organization the clothes of all these people were new and freshly trimmed the knives were mounted not with brass but with silver so mounted you mount a horse and then the knife is mounted mounted as in the handle of the knife okay the knife is mounted on the handle so this handle was not of um, uh, brass but of silver which had been rubbed perfectly clean the girdles and pouches suited well with their knives well seemed each of them good citizens worthy to sit in a guild hall's uh, guild hall's dais now here's the uh, here is the mention of the guild now you have to understand the concept of guild or the guild system okay so the guilds are defined as associations of craftsmen and merchants formed to promote the economic interests of their members as well as to provide protection and mutual aid now see all the goldsmiths they'll form one group all the weavers will form one group all the dyers will form one group or all the um, uh, say all the um, bakers will form one group all of these different different people will form different groups these groups are called guilds and now they will form these different groups and through these groups they're going to talk about uh, their rights what they want uh, the kind of resources that they want to better their trade they would do all of this within these guilds now you might have a question guilds is of particular association of particular people who belong to particular jobs but here everybody is uh, from a different uh, job everybody a haberdasher weaver dyer and tapestry maker they are all from different jobs how do they form a guild that is also possible according to the definition you see there guilds are defined as associations of craftsmen and merchants formed to promote economic interests and the members uh, uh, economic interests of their members as well as to provide protection and mutual aid mutual aid so guilds of course all bakers can fall, uh, form a guild all the goldsmiths can form a uh, goldsmiths can form a guild all the say um all the weavers can form a guild but also different people can form a guild if their uh, if their um, if their wants match so the haberdasher carpenter web dyer and tapisser or this tapestry maker can form a guild also if their wants are the same if they're fighting for the same cause if they want resources so all of them wore the same clothes so you can have guilds of these different people different groups or you can have different people from different trades different craftsmen also coming together forming a guild but they're fighting for the same cause they are talking about their common wants so it is about promotion of economic interests how to better their uh, business and also their members um, uh, of their members and to provide protection and mutual aid mutual aid so here we have all of these four people from different occupations who belong to a properly uh, probably a distinguished organization and you can distinguish them and identify them how because they're wearing the same clothes the same kind of uniform so this is a guild each one of them by virtue of their knowledge was worthy to be an alderman for they had 
had enough property and income and the wives would also attest to the fact otherwise they would have been at fault for indeed it is uh, pleasant to be addressed as madam so because of these people who uh, these people who had a lot of wealth and income because of the uh, business and all of this their wives he's saying their wives would be really proud because who doesn't want to be called madam who doesn't want that kind of treatment right so he's saying to head ceremonial processions on festive occasions this is what their wives probably did they were called madam they would head um, they would be called madam wherever they went they would be um, the head of ceremonial processions on festive occasions and to have their uh, cloaks carried by servants in a manner of queens so these people this is their influence these are the guildsmen who this is their influence that their money and income even their wives were reaping the benefits of it they were giving given the princess treatment so to say so this is who these guildsmen are we're going to do a analysis of all of them so let's get right into that now this is very important there might be a question that is asked which of the following characters do not tell a tale in the canterbury tales it is the guildsmen the group uh, of these guildsmen doesn't have a tale and only appear in the prologue so two sets of question and answers you get it right here which character or characters in the canterbury tales appear only in the prologue and not in the text text okay not in the story it's these guildsmen and if there's a question that who do not tell a tale at all in the uh, canterbury tales so it's the guildsmen or if they give you individually haberdasher carpenter weave if one one uh, option is there it's either all of the above or if they give you one name say haberdasher and other options haberdasher you'll click so these are the people who don't have a tale to tell in the canterbury tales and they appear only in the prologue so chaucer describes the characters as having a brotherly bond uh, they are all from different trades but wear the same uniform indicating that the fraternity to which they belonged had common social and religious aims like i just explained they dressed in clothing associated with their trade back then craftsmen all wore a certain type of uniform based on their craft kind of similar to the way jobs certain wear um, certain jobs wear certain uniforms so the guildsmen have been described by chaucer in a collective manner so you do not have haberdasher described in a different way or you don't have so this is to highlight what the society of the times he is actually i told you right that the canterbury tales uh, actually he is known as a father of english literature firstly because of his genius the way he has written the canterbury tales but also because literature is a reflection of life itself so here he is uh, he's reflecting the society itself to the canterbury tales and he has done this deliberately he has included the guildsmen together and described them collectively because that's how they were supposed to behave a guild was supposed to behave as a unit as an organization working towards the same socio political and religious goals so this is what he has done deliberately and again just to give a little recap this group is the only one that does not tell a tale in the canterbury tales they only appear in the prologue so the group doesn't have a tale and only appears in the prologue so now we're going to move on further now we come to the cook it is relatively very easy nothing to brainstorm on there's no analysis video here also he's just describing the cook as he is so they had a cook with them on this occasion who had a cook with them on this occasion it is the guildsmen and in order to boil the chickens with the marrow bones and to prepare sharp uh, tasting spices and flavors he could well appreciate it uh, he could well appreciate a drink of the famous london ale he could roast and boil and broil and fry stew and well bake a pie but it is a great pity i thought that on the lower part of his leg he had an ulcer he was so good at making spiced chicken that he could compete with the best of cooks okay nothing to brainstorm there's direct okay everything that's explained here is direct you just have to remember that um with uh, the sergeant of law he was uh, accompanied by whom uh, we just did a few minutes ago he was accompanied by the franklin i'll just check this again okay i think that that's what how could i just forget yeah okay so the sergeant of law was accompanied by the franklin now the guildsmen are accompanied by the cook okay so you have the cook who is accompanying them this is a very short character uh, um description that he has given so i don't think so there's any need to dwell on this any further this is a direct description of the cook we are going to move on to the shipman so we are going to analyze the last character for this video uh, in our video today he is the last character who we are going to analyze uh, read and analyze and then we are going to move on further in part 3 of the video 
So we are going to talk about the shipman. So a shipman was there and he was the resident of the West Country. Probably he came from the southwest port of Dartmouth and he rode upon a heavy powerful horse as well as he could. So you remember he has a powerful uh, horse in contrast to who? The clerk of Oxford who did not have a powerful horse. His horse was as thin as a rake. And here we have a grown and a very... Um, powerful well-fed horse so you know that it's a well-fed horse because it's powerful right so it has the nutrients that it needs so physically this horse was powerful and he was wearing a gown of coarse cloth that reached his knee a dagger hanging on a cord that hung around his neck and beneath his arm so there's a cord that hung around his neck and beneath his arm so there was a dagger which was hanging here and um, the hot summer had tanned his complexion and certainly he was a good fellow now see, the description after here is nothing good, okay? So again, Chaucer is employing sarcasm, satire, sarcasm, irony in actually describing the shipman. So he says, certainly this person was a good fellow. He had stole plenty of wine from the cargo which he had undertaken to carry from Bordeaux while the owner was asleep. So you trust this person, a shipman, that you please, you transfer the cargo from one place to another. The shipman, when the owner is asleep, he stole wine from the cargo while the owner was asleep. So, you know, corruption, you see malpractice. So he is not at all a good man. Okay, he was a rascal. If you actually see this part and suddenly he was a good fellow, it is actually to actually highlight the fact that he's a rascal. So and certainly he was a good fellow. He had um, stole plenty of wine from the cargo which he had undertaken to carry from Bordeaux while the owner was asleep. Of good conscience, he took no key care and never listen to that means he never listened to his voice in his head never listened to his conscious he never took care did not care never listened to and he took no keep no care of the conscience in his mind he never listened to it so if he fought and won victory over his adversities he threw them into the water so here the line reads by water he sent them home to every land so it's by water he sent them home that is he used to push them or throw them into the water and leave them for dead there so he threw them into the water, but he was excellent in his craft of calculating the time of ocean tides. So this is all about navigation. This is all about uh, shipping. This is all about uh, exploration. Now you'll know this that we are moving towards the age of Elizabeth. In the age of Elizabeth, it's the age of exploration, like I've mentioned. So there, navigation took the forefront. Exploration took the forefront, and here it is beginning. It's taking baby steps, you know. So he knows how to calculate the ocean tides, judging ocean currents. He knows how to watch the movements of the moon uh, in the sky and steering his ship. So, you know, he uh, took all of these as signs. Today we have instruments. Today we have ways and means through which we can make navigation very easy, right? We have machine and tools to do that for us. But that time they relied on their senses, on their observation, on their experience. So this is highlighted by that. He knew the ocean tides. He could read the ocean tides, ocean currents. The moon in the sky would help him steer his ship. The position of the moon in the sky. So there was no one from Hull in Yorkshire to Carthage in Spain uh, who could... Um, equal him in such skills he was tough and cunning in his undertakings with many a tempest had his beard been shake now what does this mean again he's not uh Chos is not saying this because it sounds pretty but there's a point to it many tempests had had shaken his beard what does it mean these are the um, these are the proof of his experience these are the proof that he had gone out on voyages on explorations it, this is proof that as a shipman he had traveled uh, to distant lands and that's the proof is what that many a tempest you know many storms had shaken his beard these are uh, proof in his physicality of his experience okay so he was familiar with all the harbors from Gotland to the Cape of uh, Finister and um, he knew every inlet in Britain and Spain his ship was called Madeleine or Madeline so what they're saying over here is that he knew everything that was to know as an experienced shipman and he was good at what he did now we're going to do the character analysis and uh, we're going to end with the video for today so what is there that we have to know about the uh, shipman? So he represents the occupation of rising importance during Chaucer's time and the whole culmination of it will take place in the Elizabethan era. I've already explained the age of Elizabeth. I've done a Renaissance video. So please 
watch the videos if you haven't watched them yet a detailed description of renaissance uh, education ship uh, shipping navigation everything i've dealt there so this is the age of exploration so to say and the age of elizabeth so we've done all of this so it represents an occupation of rising importance during chaucer's time uh, age of elizabeth shipping is going to be pivotal for england's power right so from the 14th century onwards the sea and those who ventured on it became vital to england's interests we immediately notice his inabil inability to ride a horse he was very able in riding the ship but not able to ride the horse so remember the age was the precursor to the elizabethan age also known as the renaissance period build up had begun this is the time that it actually started so the shipman is a sailor who comes from the middle class a moderately rich class that was new to the medieval social system although the shipman isn't as wealthy as others he's still an experienced sailor and was even captain of his own ship called the madeleine or madeline so we are done with the shipman we're going to do the last we're going to analyze and read and we're going to look at the last uh, set of characters in a part three video so this is it for today if this video has been helpful for you then don't forget to like the video share the video and subscribe to my channel for similar content until we meet again i really hope that you stay healthy and happy see you in the next one guys